everyone. This is I4J's 12th, if you can believe it, interactive video presentation and Q&A session with the unstoppable Monique Morrow. <laughs> and today's topic is, can we use AI to achieve gender neutrality? So my name is Ben Baldwin, and I'm hosting this series for David and Vint. I started the series because I think we should be sharing a little bit more and helping each other. We're very good at that, so this is another forum to do that. And uh, just as quick background, this isn't my day job. I am the founder of a company called Scale Driver. It's a system that better predicts innovation success and speeds it up because it's customized for a company's culture. So this is a particularly relevant topic to a lot of the work that I do. So I'm glad you could, uh, you could join us. And this is live video in particular because I feel it's a great way to introduce ourselves as a group and share what we're working on on an informal way. And we can even ask for help. So the video technology itself allows everybody to interact in, in real time. So I've started by putting everybody on mute. Uh, you can unmute yourselves, but all I request is that if you have a question during the question period time, that you introduce yourself to Monique and to the audience so that she and the audience know who you are. So for instance, David, we know who you are, but if you could just kind of reintroduce yourself when you have a question, that would be, that'd be great because this session is also going to be recorded. Now, if you have a question for me, that uh, little side part of the screen is a chat feature, so you can write me a note and uh, I'll get back to you either through the chat feature or you can ask it live. Again, it's casual form, so you can uh, choose which medium you want. So, last thing is, uh, like I said, it is recorded and this is an open link, so some people will be joining to, uh, to watch, and uh, you may not recognize them, but let's welcome them. So um, I'll get out of the way and turn it over to Monique. Okay, so thank you so very much. Um, I'm really, really excited uh, to, to be doing this um, the session with everyone. I'm Monique Morrow, for folks who do not know me, uh, Chief Technology Strategist in the industry, and most recently was um, CTO of New Frontiers Engineering at Cisco. Uh, to set this discussion up, uh, this is, I'm just fresh from uh, Cambridge, uh, MIT, Multimedia Labs, where we were talking about augmented reality uh, in action and looking at what augmented experiences can be. Uh, and I th it really is quite appropriate when we are thinking about um, using uh, technology, particularly artificial intelligence, or I could add augmented reality, to think about not just de gender neutrality, but I'll, um, call, I'll talk about it as uh, people neutrality. And so I want people to, to keep that in mind. This is kind of a, a discussion I actually had uh, at the Airbnb Open Air event in San Francisco on June 8th, and it was quite provocative. And I think uh, prior to coming on to this call today, I was telling Ben that, um, you know, Bob, I, <laughs> we were talking about sort of ethics and, and technology uh, last week, and Bob Metcalf uh, called me dangerous. And I think that's a good thing, because when you're dangerous, you're provocative. And so that's the nature of this uh, discussion here today. So I'm very, very happy to, to, to talk about it. So if you can uh, put up the, the first slide for me, that would be fantastic. Um, so it is about uh, people neutrality, but the notion here is to think about starting with women. Uh, for people who know me, I'm very focused on, on looking at how we get more women in technology. It's a big topic. It certainly was a topic at WEF, the World Economic Forum. It seems to be a topic overall. It is uh, related to anybody who knows our sustainable development goals. It is related to sustainable development goal number five out of 17 sustainable development goals, with number one, being ending uh, poverty. So there has to be some kind of correlation between those, those 17 SDGs. That's number one. And, and so um, I think that's real important to think about it. How can we use, and this is a, a question to ask of ourselves, rather than talking about statistics and numbers and bemoaning the fact that we're not seeing enough of X, we're, we are large in part technologists and we are large in part, uh, we have a very eclectic background. We have to think about uh, what this could mean. If you go to the next slide, please. And the next two slides are going to be fairly provocative. This was yesterday at the uh, uh, World uh, Web Forum in Zurich. Now, tell me what you see in that picture. <laughs> Let's say, what do you don't see in that picture? And um, 
the World you know, Web Forum, uh, we had Tim Berners-Lee, uh, one of the keynote speakers the, the day before. I, I would say 90% of the participants look like what you see here. And um, the individuals uh, who are standing represent a panel on fintech. And I happen to be sitting next to a lady who is, leads um, innovation at UBS. And she said, this is typical. So my question was, where are the women? The next slide, please. That's typical. <laughs> well, you can point it out. So, so why this becomes interesting is because I don't think we're aware of really the realities of, of what we see today, unless you're right in the middle of it. And I, and I think this was very important. It was a very important summit right after WEF uh, last week. And this is about bringing Silicon Valley. By the way, the, the leading, thing, leading line was bringing Silicon Valley into Zurich. So that's what, what came up. So let's go to, to, for, to the next slide, please. I think when I frame this up, it is, it's more about you knowing the headlines themselves uh, and, and um, the whole notion when we talk about women particularly, uh, whether they are refugees, whether we look at um, what parity can look, uh, be. It's not even a, uh, people talk about glass, ceilings, but in flat fact, they're glass cliffs. So we have to ask ourselves if social scientists, well, how do we define masculinity and so on and so forth. So it is a very, very, very complex problem or a complex issue. But we still, these are what you see in the headlines. This is what we often read, let alone uh, attending an event like I attended yesterday. So I want to keep that in the, in the background because I think it's important to have it as its background. Next slide, please. Um, well, you know, it's there, you can't get away with, you can't cover it, you cover it up. I mean, it's like, it, it, you're talking about 7.4 billion and counting people in the year, uh, you know, uh, individuals or inhabitants, and you have a, a certain percentage of the population. And by the way, I'm, I'm highlighting people neutrality. Uh, this is one portion of the population. Uh, we can talk about all kinds of, 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 of portions here. Uh, but 51% of, of, of that population happen to be women. And therefore, it goes back to those UN Sustainable Goals. Um, when I talk about the UN Sustainable Goals, it's real important be, uh, because um, I had spent uh, a week in, in Canberra at Australia National University. The uh, Dean of Computer Sciences and Engineering is Dean Eleanor Huntington. And if you count female deans in, in, in uh, engineering and sciences, um, throughout the world. I think it's probably around a handful. You can correct me, but I think it's around a handful. And what she's trying to do is really bring into a, 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 an interesting mix. But the point is her PhD students absolutely, her researchers absolutely map their papers, their research to the, uh, the sustainable development goals, which I find very, very interesting. All right, next slide. These are sort of the statistics. And so therefore, there is this, this, this revolution, uh, if you want to call it, that, that is taking place. And, you know, we, we, women are forming this part of the industry, and they are definitely part of the workforce, the tech workforce. We all know that. Next slide, please. So the question is, I mean, the, the reality here is, and this is where we get into the frame of, of could we imagine using technology here? We, we are um, infected by unconscious bias. We really are. We just don't, you know, we, we, I am, we all are. And so we're the, this composition, if you will, of all of these, uh, these connections. And so how do we think we can embed that awareness within the DNA, uh, and I call it the DNA of an organization. And here's where I'm going with the use of technology to do this. Typically, uh, what happens is that you or an enterprise will have an unconscious bias, um, um, let's say, where, workshop, and it's uh, kind of interesting and people uh, check it off and they leave. But how lasting and how, 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 how much of that has an effect of an ind to an individual? And so, so if we are um, in agreement that we are infected, that is our reality. Let's go to the next slide, please. Why don't we think about gamifying it? 
So this is a test question. Who do you know? Who, how many people know? Just raise your hand if I can see you. <laughs> know who that person is. That's David Hume. And so David Hume is this Scottish, um, you know, he's a Scottish uh, philosopher. Basically what we're, you know, you can imagine you are sort of the, um, you're, you're really slaves to your passions is really what, what we were thinking here and what his thinking was. And so if we think about gamifying this whole notion of, 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 of people neutrality, uh, people expect an award. Some people expect to be rewarded. And so you, that's the, the, the notion here. There is that, that uh, you know, sort of a token system that we think it can be interesting. And Jane McConaughey McConaug uh, has done some very uh, interesting work in this space. So one question to ask is, as we use technologies to think about some notion of people neutrality, could we think about some gamification as part of the process and sort of a reward in sort of some token as part of that process. Uh, next slide, please. So um, some of the uh, examples here is you become sort of the design, you become responsible. It's beyond what I'll call narrow AI constructs. And you're really looking, I mean, Stanford University has done some pretty good stuff here in terms of their persuasion lab, persuasion lab, or persuasive lab. And so, captology research has been really interesting and what per participation could look like. Now, I'm going to take a step back because where I'm going here is the, if you are an enterprise or if you are in an organization, you're going to want to gamify the whole premise and hypothesis here is to gamify it, have the, uh, a person um, opt-in or the member of the organization opt-in. And so what could be used here when we are gamifying it is you can, it can become part of a typical education. Um, I think it can um, particularly be used to um, significantly improve, for example, our, our collective ability to identify people um, uh, who, with people who have very different experiences and perhaps um, maybe counteracting forces in today's society that atomize us and diminish our capacity to empathize. Next slide, please. So this is kind of sort of the research here. It's not so much of what I know, it's what I don't know. And, and, and here again, you, you look at what I don't know. So what is embedded in a photo or what you put in a, what you put in a photo that you, or a uh, picture that you put in your presentation? Is there something implied? Are you implying some, a certain bias, for example? There's also the notion of agency, context agency, where you get into a sort of emotion um, that um, could be uh, also used or detected in these sets of technologies. So uh, that becomes very, very interesting in, in, in itself. Please, next slide. So again, if I'm thinking about uh, how you adver advertise jobs or positions, you know, uh, what you're, how are those jobs and positions advertised? What does it look like? Does it look like you're going for one set of a population? I think we know that. Um, and I think what we need to think about is um, going for this notion of what I call gamification. And I'm going to stop here for just a moment because I want to double click down on what that could look like. If, for example, uh, I opt in, I start with a zero deficit of, 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 of tokens. Only, um, and, and for example, I will be notified by my own, let's say, um, cognitive avatar of the behavior that I'm exhibiting. Only I will know that. So for example, if I send an email out that seems to be loud, or seems to be aggressive, I'll probably be notified, you know, look, do you mean to send it with that tone of language? Um, and maybe I'll have a, maybe I'll get a deficit. Or maybe if I didn't even read my email, maybe I'll get a, a, a you know, a, a badge of some sort. But that's one sort of a, a way. And then at the end of it, I mean, I have certain tokens that um, I'm able to exchange, and maybe that it could be, um, Renumerated, if you will, in some sort of a a bonus or some sort of a uh, an interesting badge of behavior that becomes becomes you know known or I get recognition for. But if I look at now, if I use augmented reality, 
augmented reality is now I'm going to go into some level of exposure therapy or exposure, if you will. Could you imagine experiencing me as a woman and I experiencing you as a man? Could you imagine experiencing sexual harassment? What would that look like? What would that feel like? Uh, could you imagine for a, a, a moment a police officer um, being a recent immigrant? Or could you imagine experience me as a, an African-American or a Latino or so much so? What would that look like? What would that feel like? And I think that becomes extraordinarily interesting because the premise here is that we have multiple identities that we may want to exhibit, explicit, um, exhibit. and you know this becomes very. The, we we would I think this is my hypothesis. We would actually reduce a quote diversity officer to be somewhat less, uh, maybe more strategic, and we as members of an organization become much more involved. Uh, because we are experiencing perhaps behavior and being aware of our behavior that may be counter-social, if you will, uh, or, or, a not, uh, or our own biases, number one. Number two is there is a notion of gamification. And, and number three is we're opting in. We're becoming constantly aware of our biases. And this is where I think the, the use of technology becomes or artificial intelligence, augmented reality becomes extraordinarily interested, interesting in the process. Next slide, please. So I think, because I want to allow time for uh, interaction there, I think it would be interesting to explore more as a call to action for, for members on this call, what gamification can look like. Uh, in an organization, especially when we're talking about this use of sets of technologies uh, in the space to create some notion of people neutrality. I always start say start with women because I think that's a, a real important um, aspect here, uh, given the fact that w women do represent a great proportion of the population today. Um, the other notion is because otherwise we become an echo chamber of ourselves. And I think we, it's a, a, an interesting question of whether or not we can actually counter that. Um, create a new discipline of social science engineering. Um, now, this may be starting, this may exist already in some universities uh, or starting to exist. Um, I know that at Australia National University, they certainly want to do that. Dean Eleanor Huntington wants to do that. She is actually embedding an ethnographer in her organization. She is looking at, um, um, uh, you know, having a, uh, an anthropologist as part of the School of Engineering. She's working across the uh, organization to include psychologists, social scientists, um, because it it's even though you're talking about mega, uh, very, very profound research, uh, she sees that she has to develop students and bodies of research that are going to be much more uh, multidisciplinary, if you will. And so this aspect of social entrepreneurship, this aspect of virtual, um, uh, of, of artificial intelligence, and looking at how schools are, are developing their uh, students becomes very interesting. And I think, you know, uh, I think it's more important to think about not be count, being counting, counted as a statistic, but being able to use technology to change behavior. And I think we need to think about how we do that and be, be very, very experiential about it. I am really arguing for experiential usage of technology to be aware of our biases our unconscious bias, if you will, to be um, uh, so because I believe that um, having spoken with a few people in the industry, that it does it does um, there is something that becomes very very uh, uh, let's say long lasting, if you will, when you when you do that, and um, and then of course the whole gamification. So the thing of of it is is that could we think about about those sets of technologies to, to do that. And um, so, next slide. So what does success look like? Well, that could be it. 
Um, I, I honestly believe success means we don't have to talk about it anymore. I mean, I honestly believe that. And I think that, 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 that now those are the front pages. But I think that could be it. You know, you sort of, you come to the, to the premise of you are now speaking the same, di speaking the same language and, um, and, and you're working very, very collabor collaboratively to, to use these sets of technologies to, to really think about, um, you know, uh, changing the the behaviors that we do see in, in enterprises today. Next slide, please. These are engineers in development, and um, I think that's uh, that's really very very important. Uh, don't laugh, but your biases are formed, um, uh, or your roles are formed by the age of four. And so, um, you know, I had uh, a. a a friend, two friends who are astro, uh, who are scientists, their daughter came home at age six and said, you know, mom and dad, I can't do math anymore because I'm not a, I'm not a boy. And um, they were shocked as scientists, as parents who are scientists. And so I, I think what they ended up doing is working with her and said, you know, you can become anything you want. And of course, I know that Esther's on the call. She is a profound educator and, and, and certainly is changing the world and education um, uh, that we need to to have but uh, their daughter today by the way is an astrophysicist just as an fyi so last slide um there is a book um just published in september of this past year uh it is called the internet of women i was one of the um, co-editors of the book uh, it includes social scientists it's around 30 countries it's a uh, very very profound narratives uh, they're, they're set to inspire, um, so you'll have entrepreneurs, you'll have uh, uh, men who have, um, uh, who have made it uh, very much their business to, to, um, to look at ha looking, looking upon women as equals. They're also looking at, um, uh, you know, what, does, what is the definition that you have uh, of, of masculinity mean, for example? How do we use technology to actually, this is one of the examples I was talking about, to look at uh, thinking about some notion of people neutrality. Um, and it's, it's, you know, been a very, very interesting journey. And it's across um, 30 countries globally. So I think that um, if you have a chance, I do encourage you to go and read the book. <laughs> because, um, you know, it's, it's really, 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 really quite interesting. And that's it. Open it up for questions, comments. Thanks, Monique. That was, uh, that was great. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to unmute people. I'm also going to take it off full screen so I can see my sidebar in case anybody's been asking me questions, which they have. So um, I will just unmute people. And then at the same time that I unmute people, I'll also... You are there we go. Unmuted. Actually, you know what? There we go. We've got like an echo. Whoa. Bad idea. Okay, hold on. Here we go. Let's try that so I'm, again. I'm actually, I'm actually reading the chat. So it says chats are, are fantastic. Okay, okay, perfect. Do you want to answer from the chats and then uh, call people out? Um, so uh, let's see. Let me go back to the chats. Maybe that's better. Um, so some are private, so I'll leave them private. Um, uh, Guy Bieber has Love Jane's book, Reality is Broken. Uh, Google has an interesting practice of having the hiring group only look at the transcript. That's, that's great. Cats, Kylie, to everyone, seems like a smart solution. Uh, interesting use of the work, and, um, and to everyone. Okay, smart. And then, um, right, the SDG mapping, Kenan. So, yeah, the SDG mapping to scientific research is really interesting. Um, that, that's true. I, I found it, it was really, um, you know, speaking to the PhD candidates at ANU, they were, they were very clear as how they were mapping their, their thesis uh, to the, um, to the uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which I found very fascinating in my, you know, myself. Um, yep. Uh, the conscious and unconscious, the personas, the stereotypes. Thank you, David, as always. <laughs> And uh, Rebel Girls, uh, yes. And of course, we have um, Pete Forsyth. It's always a pleasure to see you, Pete. <laughs> and the interesting thing, David, is um, he's asking a question. We can program people's minds very efficiently with modern approaches, should we? Now, David, great question, because that is what the topic was. Uh, 
this is a major topic when we're talking about the pitfalls of augmented reality or the use of artificial intelligence because we can actually over rotate. For example, yes, we can treat people who are um, who who are medically who are traumatized for you know by uh, PTSD, for example, or, or, or um, and that's that has that experiential value. But could we over rotate? And have people so immune to it that you send them in as immune soldiers to trauma? Um, or could we over rotate and uh, have it so prescriptive that you don't allow for randomness and serendipity? Um, that you have, have it so prescriptive. And so this is why the whole notion of ethics and, and what we're doing in technology, which is driven by, there is this whole global initiative my triple E on, on ethics in, in, in um, autonomic, um, autonomous systems has just been launched. So there is a paper that is public to everyone. Um, so you can all go, go grab it and it's uh, pu you know, for everyone to, to, to look at because it's so new. And there are uh, several committees, one of which is the one that I'm co-chair of, which is Mixed Reality. But you have legal, a legal framework, um, you know, that goes on to look at do robots have rights, um, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, yeah. So what I was, what I was going to say is um, what I'll do is we have a couple questions. People are raising their hands. Okay. So if we flip it over to have people ask their video questions, the real person, not the written person, then all they need to do is unmute, introduce themselves and ask their question. Someone's, someone's raised their hand, so whoever raised their hand can, can start first. Uh, uh, it's oh, Dave. there we go. So if, if uh, there we go, David's off mute now. Hi, okay, so I'm, I'm interested in this, you know, how we can program minds, and with uh, gamification, especially with augmented reality and so on, we come to the question of, of the border between reality and unreality. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to, drastically speaking, we're talking about things like psychosis or, or uh, delusion or detachment, all these words that we've been seeing as something negative, but that maybe also has a positive counterpart. But so, so, Still, it's something very fundamental that we're, we're touching here, this, this border between what we perceive as real and not. And do you think that, uh, well, I think we should keep that border. The question is, how do we keep it? Uh, I, I think it's, uh, well, since if you're asking me, um, and of course, this, I, I, I welcome the discussion, by the way, from, from everyone who is participating. I think we just we must be cognizant of 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 what it, how we use these sets of technologies. There is how we foresee the benefits. How we you know, again, I'm looking at one one use case here to 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 call it as a use case to to look at how we achieve some notion of neutrality that which is um, you know has a, a ex, that which is experiential, but um, you know. It's for me, Dave. It's more, David. It's more of an awareness factor than anything else. I think we have to be, you know, are we? Go, are we? Are is it sufficient for us to be our own guardians? That's really an interesting question. Are, are we capable of doing that? You know, is an, another inter, interesting question. One of the people who sh I shared the panel with last week in, in, at Cambridge. Is doing research at Malt uh, Media Labs on the use of hallu ha hallucinogens, right? Which was almost like a so it was interesting on 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 reality creation, and 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 what would that mean to the person who is you know part of that? Now, uh, it's not it wasn't a, so much Carlos Castaneda like, but it was interesting because you have to define at the end of the day. Uh, here we're talking about experiential and 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 being aware of our unconscious bias to create um, uh, people neutrality, but then we were starting to talk about what realities are we living in, you know, uh, and and what does what kinds of realities will we be um, 
uh, defining? Are we living in multiple realities? And, and so on. So that got off to a yet another sets of way off discussions, but pertinent discussions, especially if we're talking about the future. And that was, that was the topic of, that was the panel. Uh, May I just sort of connect to the original topic too, because, yep. uh, you know, it's like, uh, are, are women and men equal in reality or in our dreams? Uh, you know, so are we imagining a reality where women are equal? What to be, and, or are they really for real? Uh, I think somehow we have to have a consciousness about what the world is, uh, what it is not and what it could be, and and somehow a common language that kind of when well, we make a conscious decision that you know yeah women are equal and we're going to do it. Um, do you know what I'm going for? I, 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 so here's the thing: if we put equality aside um, just for a moment, it, it's more an experiential. So, so how do you? How would you? If we if we think about using these sets of technologies, experience me as a woman, or experience uh, an individual as autistic, or experience somebody who is an African American, or experience, and then you throw in sets of uh, interesting u cases. Uh, how would you experience? What would an experience of uh, one that's commonly uh, called out, especially when we're talking about enterprises, is how would you call, how would you experience a, uh, the notion of being sexually harassed, uh, as an example? What would that feel like for you, uh, or, or or vice versa, right? What would that feel like? Is is and and would you be more cognizant of your behavior, et cetera, not uh, being aware? Uh, there's also the use of this technology when we're talking about it. it's common today. Uh, in terms of how do you have use experiential to uh, redefine the way you um, have news? For example, could you be experiencing Aleppo? It smells. It's uh, the bombs going off, and et cetera. And when that caused you to induce you to a set of actions, right? Um, so those are those are. The, I mean, there's a lot to be said about this notion of how we use it. But if we if we think about, and this is going towards the neutrality, is being able to experience one another in in a way that, you know, maybe that we're not, we're simply not aware of. Now, what would that result in? The hypothesis is it could result, maybe it results in some notion of being aware of one another and, and being cognizant, perhaps. So we have a question from, um, from Francis. Can you control your um, mic? For some reason, I can't see that your mic is on. So you may not be connected properly. Um, if you can, then then uh, um, say something right now. There we go. Mic's off. If you click it on, you can ask your question. No? All right. I think, Bob, did you have something that you... Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So, um, I, maybe I should turn this off. Can you hear me? Yes, better. It's better, oh, yes. Sorry, I was using uh, audio. So, um, fascinating talk. Um, just uh, one second introduction. Um, uh, I've been with IBM uh, for quite a few years and recently retired as the IBM Chief Accessibility Officer. And in that role, my job is to really work with the company to raise the um, uh, our overall, you know, uh, product and solution portfolio for people with disability, and also working with our HR to hire people with disabilities. But when you talk about the uh, people neutrality um, challenges or bias, and I think people with disability will be in the forefront, and so. It is very interesting that to hear you say about the uh, experiential because one of the things that um, we found that's tremendously challenging is the uh, unconscious bias. In that um, the last couple of uh, years, uh, one attempt we tried to uh, move the the company to raise not not just their awareness but really have them experiences is to have these uh, what we call the empathy labs. Mm -hmm especially for the design, product design team. And so one example is, for example, uh, to let them wear 
you know, these uh, specialized goggles so they can simulate low vision or blindness or um, to turn off the, you know, the sound completely to simulate um, um, deafness. And I think what you talked about, the gamification, have a huge, huge, uh, not only implication, but I think it's a necessity uh, in the workplace environment um, because I think all the chief diversity officers have tried everything uh, under the sun. Um, and if you look at the challenges that people with disability uh, faces, it really is an extreme case. And I, I personally believe, and this is one of the reasons I, uh, David knows this, I am very keen on uh, working with this, uh, this uh, esteemed team of uh, experts, is, is I think we absolutely have to build this kind of a concept into our workplace environment. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not even a research, it's a must do. And I will also say that you mentioned the Australia, um, the, I don't know whether people know, but the Australian government is spending $22 billion <laughs> presenting their national uh, disability insurance scheme. And uh, in part of that process is to deploy technology such as artificial intelligence, such as augmented reality. Um, so I think we actually already have a country that's using this use case. So if somehow we can leverage your work and begin to build into some of the concepts that we've been um, working on, uh, it, will be, it will be tremendous. Um, it, it's, we, we really need it, actually need it now, at least from my experience. Thank you. I, I, um, yes. It's, uh, it's, um, th th there, is, there is definitely, and I appreciate, personally appreciate the, the com uh, comments, there is definitely a sense of urgency um, in the in the industry, speaking to uh, various cross um, uh, organizations, to uh, be able to to think uh, in different ways of of of, of, of our awareness and in and and different the use of technologies to be very aware um, of of our uh, of our biases or be, and have that experiential. It was very interesting to experience what it would be to be like to be blind to 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 be deaf and 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 to to, un, to go through that and uh, you know very very profound comments thank you one of the things that i've started <clears throat> deploying is this diverse this diversity concept to groups when there are really tough decisions to make and diversity in particular is very applicable when there are a whole bunch of different perspectives on a on a decision where um you're looking for as much information as you possibly could <clears throat> it could be a company that's pivoting it could be um is this the right kind of life choice for me or for this group of people so it gives you a more holistic um body of knowledge or experience to make decisions on i think that 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 makes potentially makes better decisions. Is there any research around whether it's boards and the diversity of boards, not just the composition of boards and how well those companies are doing, but is there any information that you have around boards that have faced difficult decisions like a pivot or a change in the company direction and how the composition of that board was from a from a gender or diversity perspective? Like when those critical decisions were made, did they make better decisions? Is there any information like that? Or has anybody collected that? So part that's of it is a, diversity. That's and an part yeah, that's an interesting question, right? That's a very interesting question to look at. You know, at the time of something, at the time a company had to go through a critical pivot, what was, what was the board compos what did that board composition look like? I, I myself would be interested in that level of research. Because I've started to see that the most critical decisions are um, at least this is anecdotal. The people I know are those are the mo people most open to the most diversity. And I just it would be great to find opportunities like that to not just bake um, face to face diversity and like a people literally in a room as if we could apply those scenarios in scale through artificial intelligence would be really cool yep. and make better decisions on mass. Sounds anyway. like an action. Sounds like an action. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that in my spare time. Sounds like an action. Thank you. 
Any other questions from people? Kenan has her head raised. Yes, and I managed to hide my whole self. And I can't unhide, so I apologize. Don't don't hide, please. <laughs> I don't know where the button is anyway. Um, so, um, so one of the things that I found very interesting, and uh, I am I'm the executive director for Reimagine Science out of Washington D.C., but I work out here on the West Coast, mm -hmm. and I've been looking at the tech sector as this um, sort of predecessor breakthrough breakthroughs that have happened in the me to we transition that have happened within the software <coughs> development industry, et cetera. And um, we recently had a living room salon in Washington, DC about trust and ethics and science because the core basic research is undergoing a major sort of breakdown and change right now. The, the thing that comes up for me, and this has been part of a discussion, is this um, in service to what? The question of, and Monique, you, you sort of pointed to this a few minutes ago, that um, is it necessary to have a larger container that has people with their, their mission or what they're working on um, addressed from others outside of themselves? Or is it just a personal choice? And I think very much we're at a point of, evolution of societal structures where the the structure of the group is really key both so that there's a, a consensus on in service to what what the larger vision is what the larger purpose of the group is but also caretaking of each other mm -hmm. to pull people back I I into that vision because we will always be falling out of it and doing things that we're not aware of this unconscious bias issue where we just don't know that we are playing out these um, subterranean subconscious biases. We aren't aware they're in our blind spot. We can't see them. And that's why the group is so necessary. And I'll say one last thing. We, um, we featured Alexandra Ivanovich at one of our TEDx's in using virtual reality where when you, for instance, I think one of the studies she cited was you're kind of, you're a purple, you know, a very non-human person and and it actually gets you out of this identity with your own culture and with your own skin and so very we're very interested in what that virtual reality aspect can do to help with this inherent bias which I think is part of that bigger picture of in service to what because in service to the whole group and 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 what society is doing what we're doing on the planet together is what I think the in service to part um, is pointing to so. Mm. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes, I'm. I'm fascinated. I, I now understand that you're talking about the, the experiential learning, as I think that's fantastic. And also, what Katz brought up here that companies with the mixed boards are doing better, right? Mm -hmm. so actually, that creates uh, that, that creates like an economic incentive to to implement these things, right? Mm -hmm. So, in a good economy, it, companies would kind of race to develop these learning things and apply them on people who elect boards and so. On. I I think that might actually happen. Um, I'm just thinking. I, I don't know even how to phrase it as a question, but the the connection between the economic reinforcement loop and and these tools we have for shaping our minds, right? Uh, that's that's kind of a, a huge thought that how we change our minds gets kind of wired into economic incentives in the economy. Mm -hmm. You don't need to comment. I mean, it's, it's just a thought, but. It could lead us anywhere, basically. It could lead us anywhere where the economy points us. Yeah. Um, I, um, I acknowledge the comment. <laughs> so, so, so some more parsing and more thinking, right? Now, but I'm, I want to go back to the board question. Um, there's sufficient data to suggest that um, you know, uh, we, the, the data is out there. Uh, and the, re the research is out there to suggest that when you have mixed boards, um, balanced boards, um, companies do fairly well. I mean, uh, um, you know, they, they, they do fairly well. But I'm going back to Ben's question is when you have a company that has been 
in the middle of a major transformation, what has been the composition of that board at the time it's transforming itself? That becomes an interesting set, a subset of data that would be interesting to look at, perhaps. Um, and uh, there are what you may, so, so that's something to, to, to probably consider as, as uh, additional data to, to, to consume. Uh, could it be, for example, that, um, could it be, uh, one question to throw out is, could it be that uh, you may have, may not have that, that balance, or maybe that uh, there is um, that a person uh, decides, or, or maybe the board decides to give um, a person, maybe in the form of a woman, the most impossible job. <laughs> And that sets her up for failure. We have cases like that, by the way, in the industry. So, um, and, and we do. We really do. <laughs> and, you know, take that job. It, it'll, uh, it'll do wonders. And nobody else could do anything with it because it was a sinking ship. But what experiential, going back to, would, would we being cognizant of what it is we're doing and how we are behaving rather than being an echo chamber of ourselves? The whole, the whole premise here is being aware of our biases and with that and, and, and with the gamification and with the use of technology, would that have a function of ch behavior change? Would that result in some kind of desired behavior change? Would that result in somebody actually saying, being very cognizant of their, of their biases if we know that we are indeed infected by it? Um, and so it, it, we, we cannot eliminate it, but it's more uh, looking at how we uh, use these sets of technologies um, to, to perhaps gamify behavior such that it is desire, uh, such that it goes to quote, in quote, some notion of desired uh, behavior, and to what sets of, of goals. I, I, I think it's um, more, uh, you know, that which is purposeful and that which is going to serve, you know, um, uh, humanity at the end. I mean, at the end, we're all uh, parts of this population. So the betterment, that's more the altruistic part of me <laughs> coming out. I think, Shelley, you had a question, didn't you? Yeah, more like um, what I was thinking about was uh, the gamification when we say that a certain, actually what we're saying perhaps, is that a certain way is better than the other. And we put here um, a judgment on something that people are actually uh, free to have their biases. I think that what you're saying about awareness is extremely true. And the more we are aware about who we are and how we think, where we come from, and where our biases come from, the more we can get away from these biases. Mm -hmm. But the value that we put on these biases, whether they're right or wrong, this is a very, very broad, um, it's a huge field that is so... Uh, culture bound and uh, time bound, historical bound, right? Things that we valued some years ago look for us really ridiculous now. And so this is a very um, dynamic field. And sometimes we wish to um, speed up processes that have, I don't know, their own speed, their own process. And that's something that it's, I don't know if it's my philosophic mind here speaking or what, but uh, just the thought about that I truly believe about the awareness and, you know, have my thoughts about the rewarding part. What is mm. it that we want to reward here? That's and how, I mean, how, what are we forcing? Yeah. Well, I, I, so, um, you know, going back, Charlie, thank you very much for that uh, comment or obs the observation here, the, the, the game, it seems, if we study organizational behavior, and I mean, I'm being in the middle, having been in the middle of complex organizations and looking at how uh, people ha try to have these sort of innovation challenges, et cetera, and, and et cetera, one of the things that seemed, as an observation, seems to be, that seems to engender a lot of uh, uh, participation is this notion of, What's in it? Well, there's a question of what's in it for me, right? There's that question, what am I going to get in return? And so that's where this sort of this notion of token, token or, or, or gamification comes in. 
um, else you don't want to force it, right? You, uh, on one hand, I mean, I wouldn't want to be forced, but on the other hand, I would want to look at how I could, uh, obviously we depend upon human behavior to do the right thing, just volunteer and do the right thing. But if we think that it's not, if we think about maybe alternative uses of, of technology, or maybe using technology to sort of create awareness, that would be one sort of it, uh, of notion of it. And tokens or, 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 or however way that, badges of honor, whatever it is, people love their badges. Um, you know, they, they just seem to love it. I mean, I came from an enterprise that loved badges. Uh, and I have a lot of them. <laughs> and scars along the way. So, but I think it's, it's perhaps an area to be further studied on one hand, and looking at what we need to, to, to how we need to uh, deal with this sense of urgency on the other, you know, this balance. Um, so, but it is a hypothesis, it is a, it is a hypothesis that's, you know, I'm posing here and then something for us all to look at. So we have about five minutes left. We My, were just getting started. I know. <laughs> you can come on again. This is great. No, it's fantastic, time. fantastic observations. Um, so five minutes left. Um, did, did anybody do uh, research on the e economy of bias? I, I, uh, that's an interesting question. I'm not aware of economy of bias, what that would look like. Well, you know, it's like if we have a common language, which includes a common bias, that will create a certain economy, you know? Mm -hmm. And like... Say, for example, women shouldn't work, they should stay home. That creates a certain economy. You know, mm. Things get cheaper, other things get more expensive. You know, you can find uh, economic systems where probably uh, people have an enormous bias in some completely unrealistic way that gives the society as such, uh, you know, some kind of Darwinian advantage just because it keeps people in sync in doing something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It will be very interesting, and that couples to Khali's question also about the speed of changing bias, because you're actually kind of changing the, 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 the rules for economics as well. Right? Uh, very interesting. Very interesting call out. Are there any examples of success, you think, Monique, like some on the right track, or whether it's involving artificial um, virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, or not technology at all, just something it, technology can mimic. It, it, it's, it's, on the experiential side, it's fairly nascent. Um, you know, this is why we're talking about it in, the, in sort of an Agora way. I mean, uh, what, what you have right now in, in, in enterprises that I've observed is that uh, the people are struggling. Uh, there, there's research that's being accorded to various organizations or various institutions, but in terms of actually uh, having some level of exper experimentation along these lines, I think there's, um, it's really nascent. It's really a question of real, uh, looking at enterprises that have an appetite to do that. Um, and so be, be cognizantly aware other than, you know, engineers coming together and saying, oh, did you really mean to say that? And et cetera, et cetera. But being, being, having the use of technology to do that. I don't have an actual case that says this has been successful in enterprises. It's just, it's a hypothesis at this point in time. Yeah, this is John. Sorry, I joined late. Can you hear me? Yes, John. Yeah. Hi. Great discussion. Um, and I'm sorry I joined late, but did, did you talk about what Stanford's doing with physical transfer for, uh, and virtual reality? And, and it, did that come up on the call? Because if it didn't, um, I have some thoughts about that. I pointed to some work at Stanford uh, in this space, especially around cryptology um, and, and, and also their dark data. Now, are, you, are, you, are you familiar with the physical transfer model that they're experimenting with? It's, it's where you, you actually um, identify as yourself with VR as per usual, and then you transfer your existence into um, a, an entity that is remote from you. So you're actually watching yourself. So as you speak, um, this other entity speaks. As you raise your hands, the other entity raises its hands. As you interact with the environment, it does. And then what they do is they transform 
your physical representation that you identify with that you are watching from a, as an external person and transform gender, ethnicity, height, weight, uh, you know, and, and, and um, are getting some really, really fascinating results about um, having the direct experience of observing yourself. And what, what I get really excited about is using that um, early on with children, and I'm talking to uh, Barry Zuckerman about doing just that, um, and addressing the implicit biases that are endemic to a culture, a family, an individual, and beginning to break those uh, prejudices through the use of physical transfer very, very early on in life and make it a generational uh, kind of opportunity. So the other, the other piece is, is that I'm working with a couple of vendors who use pets as avatars to mm -hmm. uh, help uh, patients. And, and not only gender neutrality, um, but taking away any um, uh, burden or baggage of anything that may be projected onto a human image has some really interesting consequences of trust and feeling less judged. So I, 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 I think the topic of this call, both the physical transfer that they're doing in the VR lab at Stanford, as well as some of the, uh, the pet avatars specifically intended uh, to sort of neutralize all against all those biases are really interesting. And, and I think both um, uh, can be used and should be used at scale. Oh, John, this is really interesting. I, ha I was unaware of the transfer work uh, research being done at Stanford, uh, the VR lab. This, um, again, goes to um, using the, this technology for, again, uh, the uh, unconscious bi bias awareness or the awareness of how we present ourselves. Quite interesting. Thank you. Yeah, that. and I, I can really see that being used as a companion to implicit bias testing. So when you're in... A, a diverse work group in any sort of environment, whether it's professional or otherwise, and you can identify implicit biases that those can become um, essentially the targets of those technologies. So uh, I'm pretty excited about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very cool. Now, I think very we cool. are getting close to the end here. Is there a last 30 second question? Uh, we've only, well, I just have a comment. We've only just begun. <laughs> so. so I'll turn it to Monique and then I'll say one final word as we, uh, as we end. Well, thank you. So first and foremost, thank you to, to um, you know, the I4J team here. Really appreciate the opportunity to actually present a, a point of view. And I think we've just uh, really commenced with a, uh, well, we've ended with questions, more questions to, to, to look at, more research to, to understand. Um, there is perhaps an appetite to uh, double click on these sets of technologies to look at how we present ourselves and how we are aware of our own behavior. And I think the old question, of, uh, the question from David about, um, you know, what is the association or um, correlation of this, this behavior, if you will, of a conscious bias to an economy? Um, you know, what, are, what does that look like? And um, uh, to, to look at how we may uh, see how we uh, explore these sets of technologies to, to, be, uh, to talk about neutrality overall. But uh, uh, to Khali's uh, point of view, uh, uh, be careful about how, what the pace may be. You know, we may over-rotate at some point in time. Maybe not. Cool. Well, thanks very much, Monique. And thank you, everybody, for participating. This was really cool. This is the most active sidebar that I've ever seen. There are like two conversations going on. <laughs> it was perfect for my ADHD as I could actually focus <laughs> on everything at once. It was all in harmony. So um, thanks again, Monique. Uh, stay thank tuned you. for our next, I love always wanted to say that, stay tuned for our next live video Q&A session with Jim and Esther talking about the one thing, which is the one thing we can do now that takes no time, costs nothing, is easier than what we're currently doing, has already helped one of the most successful companies ever and could change our entire society. Of course, they're talking about this from the angle of education, but of course, that transcends everything. So um, that's what they're talking about. I know Katz is presenting um, coming up once we pick a date, but please, let me know if you're interested in presenting 
and um, you can present again and again and again. It's a lot of fun, right, Monique? Yeah, and, it is. Uh, it is. Thank you. You don't need a deck. You can do whatever you want. It's it's your it's your time. So if you are interested, just email me at ben at scaledriver dot com and uh, or reach out to David. It's pretty simple. But thanks everyone, and have a great day, whatever time it is where you are. Thank you so Thank very you. much. Bye-bye.